Good morning. Thank you. Uh, last time I timed this, it came out at 43 minutes. So I have a few slides I'll skip at the end if I get close to running over. I will not keep you late. One app, four platforms. Just a quick who am I since you came to hear what, I sp what I'm here to speak about, not about me personally. Uh, I spent my life in the tech business. I spent about uh, 10 years mission critical IT. I just had the pleasure of talking with Graham over here, four of those over at Morgan Stanley. We have a number of common colleagues. And about 12 plus years doing consulting, which essentially means I've worked on either multiple projects at a time or short-term projects for various needs. And there are startups mixed in there throughout the way. Ran, sort of ran two, one into the ground in uh, one of the busts, which is at least 50% my fault, not the market's fault. Openly admit it. I started on one of those. I actually did 6502 assembly programming. I remember nothing about it. But uh, a few months back, I was, for some strange reason that I won't openly admit, I was looking at uh, Intel uh, x86 assembly, and it just brought back a lot of very mixed memories. I'm also an avid hockey player. I will admit I'm not very good, though I got three goals on Saturday night, but it was a small game and a small bunch of people. I love great engineering. I really do, but it has to serve a purpose. So when I see two things, I say, that's really cool. That's nice. That's really cool. I can see how that will change how people operate. That makes things interesting to me. I'm basically a generalist, and I'm a practitioner. Real world matters to me. Purity, not so much. I love the ideological discussions. I'm not that interested in using it when it comes down to it. And incentives and culture very much matter to me. I like to think about how using a tech or doing something or setting up a compensation structure will change what people want to do. So what is serverless? Well, that's a can of worms. They say don't open it. Everybody has a different definition for it. Just wait till the real vendors get their hands on it. I'm just waiting for the, uh, uh, the big companies, no names, that will suddenly say serverless is us, like five years ago, and we are cloud, even if you weren't. But I'll take, make an attempt at doing something with it. So this is the Wikipedia definition. Serverless computing is a cloud computing execution model in which the cloud, oh god, I, I can't. I just can't. It's probably mostly right, but I really can't read it. Uh, slightly better one, if a bit pithy, uh, Paul's giving a talk later today. I think he might have given one uh, yesterday. A serverless solution is one that costs you nothing to run if nobody's using it. I don't think that's fully accurate. I'm actually going to disagree with it somewhat, but I love it. And by the way, Paul probably has more experience with production serverless than most people I have met, most people I've even heard of. So I do recommend hearing his talk whenever you do it. Uh, I've learned some really good stuff from him. Let's go with Mike Roberts. He's got, I'm an engineer at heart, so I love ordered lists. This is great. Requires no management of server hosts. It auto scales and provisions. Cost based on precise usage, meaning, oh look, I ran something for two minutes. I'm getting billed for six hours. No. Performance capabilities other than hosts. My mindset is something other than a host. And has implicit high availability or HA. I don't worry about when it goes away. It fixes itself. I like that definition. It's actually all built in the Wikipedia one, but much easier to absorb. So something's missing from that. What about, not SIMs, but if my mini SIM is a monolith, the micro SIM is microservices, what about functions or nanoservices? And uh, the first time I heard the term nanoservices was courtesy of uh, Penny Resnick, a CTO of Container Solutions, who said, where's the light on this? That as we move up into, I'm not going to go into the other side of this, because this was back in Unikernel's day. But as we move up into smaller and smaller pieces, it changes how you can organize, which is why it was interesting to me. They kindly let me put this in my blog post two years ago and use it here. What is the biggest expense any tech or tech-driven company has, meaning anybody who's going to do something in serverless? I mean, it's not how much time I pay for Amazon or Google or something. It is not my software licensing. Here's uh, Morgan Stanley's 10K, or annual report. I picked them because I was there. And if you look, Here's their uh, non-interest revenue, $34 billion US. And their ex single biggest expense line item is people, compensation and benefits. Those who know how Wall Street and the city work, you actually manage it to do that, about 50%. That's part of the reason why hiring and firing is so crazy with them. But it's people. Look at a tech company. Here's Alphabet, also known as Google. Costs and expenses in 17. I hate when some of them can do it on the left right to left and some of them left to right, uh, is about, where is this? About 110 billion, good God. Uh, cost of revenues is what it costs them to do it. So if I buy a hammer for five pounds and sell it for seven pounds, my cost of revenue or cost of goods is about five pounds. Out of all the rest, 
Here you go. R&D and sales and marketing, most of which is commissions to salespeople. People are your biggest expense, by far. So I think that if you look at that list of what makes something serverless, the number one thing that people care about is don't manage servers. It doesn't mean that functions as a service or nano services don't matter. It doesn't mean that all the other points of auto scaling don't matter. It means what's the biggest thing? What is the thing I worry about the most? And that is I don't want to think about servers. That is to me is the most important point is that serverless is serverless. As that gets better, the other things start to come to the fore and become more important. This is the cafe table metric. I used to call it the coffee table, and then my wife says, now coffee table is that little thing you have in your living room. That's a cafe table that you have at, uh, at Starbucks or Costa. And she was right, as usual. I don't usually openly admit it, but she was right. Courtesy of my colleague, Andy McCammond, who uh, not only saved my rear many times in, in my career, but also taught me a lot about how to properly appreciate scotch. I was sitting with him January, I believe, of this year at a cafe in Canary Wharf. And we were talking about some fairly modern software. And he says, look, this is the table we have. This table is our portfolio of software and services we manage or are building. This little bit over here is what you might think of as modern development. And this slice edge is what you might call something in the cloud native, leaning to serverless, anything like that. Most of the value we're going to get is if you can do something for this, not for this. Keep that in mind. This is what he said to me. He was right. Company I was with, sh introducing him to, wisely switched out of one space into another that was more valuable. So I'll make two claims, and they may be controversial. I'm happy to take arguments afterwards. I'd like to be wrong. I like being wrong. It's fun. The single most valuable part is serverless. All the rest matters later. Don't give it up, but it matters later. And nano services or functions as a service just don't define it. They're enabled by it. Being able to stop worrying about servers makes it possible for you to think about new things. But that comes with a price. Anybody know what this is? Oh, painting, yes. But it is, I forget the name of the Russian artist. It's the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, 1880, I don't remember what. Uh, the risk of having classical education is that you end up not just with painting, but with a Jewish guy at the front of the room giving you uh, the Christian Lamb of God up top. I picked the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse for the four services because the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse are bringing death and destruction, but they're also cleansing the world. It comes like that. Serverless and all these new things are to some degree are doing what we like to call disruption in the tech industry. What it really means is what we're causing damage, a lot of damage, hopefully for a better good. So at the risk of offending anybody, I put the four different platforms with which I played on the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Not any one specifically means, oh, this one is death. I actually like them all. And hopefully nobody will be too offended, especially since the invent creator of one of them is sitting right here, Alex with OpenFaz, who gave a good talk yesterday. So let's look at the four platforms. Start with Heroku. Is Heroku serverless? Well, it's the original platform as a service. Simon Wardley, who's been pushing for 10 years that FAS or serverless is the future, said, really, serverless is PaaS, not FAS. The deployment methodology is Git push. Anybody who touches software nowadays knows Git for the most part. It's not totally fair. I've been inside lots of client companies where you wouldn't believe what they're using uh, in terms of uh, version control, if at all. But most people really know what Git is at this point. And it's really easy to do a deploy. It's really easy to hook it into your CI tool chain. How serverless is this? Well, using their four points, it's kind of a two out of five. There is no management. And to be fair, when I wrote this piece of software, and I'll get to it in a minute, about seven years ago, this is what there was. You didn't want to worry about servers. This is where you went. Doesn't really auto scale. It's not totally fair. They've got some auto scaling now on, uh, on uh, their web dynos only. Costs on precise usage. Well, no, you pay for the slug that runs. It's like sort of a server. It's like more of a container, but whatever it is. So it's, it's implicit HA. If it blows up, it comes back not as fast as you want, but it does. So it kind of gets a two out of five. Fair enough. <coughs> Kubernetes. That's the darling of the container world. Yay, KubeCon is expecting 7,000 people, 6,000 in Seattle in two weeks. There were 4,000 in Copenhagen back in March or May or whenever it was. Fantastic. Deploy methodology, Kube Cuddle or Kube Control or Kube, they seem to spend more time arguing about what to call this. Apply your YAML file. What's its score? Well, that depends. If you have to manage this, and I have managed this, your score is right down to zero out of five. Anybody who's done a deployment or management of Kubernetes knows this thing is a beast to manage. It is worlds better than, oh, I used to rack servers, but still. 
On the other hand, as a developer, as an app owner, if it's done right, it's actually pretty high. And I believe somebody's giving a talk later today on why you should deploy your serverless apps on Kubernetes. I'm pretty sure I saw that in the schedule. I don't remember when. If I deploy an app, I don't worry about management. It scales pretty quickly and pretty well. Costs, not so great. There's nothing built in. Give it time. Performance definition, yes. Implicit HA, very much so. It's one of the things that Kube is really pretty good at. Next, open FAS which has, it literally open functions as a service. Uh, deploy methodology, FAS deploy, okay, not kube cuddle apply, but FAS deploy. And its serverless score is very similar, except it's much better on the precise usage and control, but it has to run on something. I don't have to worry about kube, it has to run on something. Uh, that having been said, there is an open FAS cloud now. Uh, talk to Alex afterwards if you want to learn more about it. And finally, Lambda, right? Amazon's pure functions as a service. Deployment methodology, uh, everybody seems to be still arguing about it. I would say that's a sign that there's nothing really mature or fully mature yet. There's plenty of room for consolidation. If I can do SAM deploy or AWS Lambda or CloudFormation or serverless or Terraform or uh, uh, Apex or just keep going, uh, every week there's another one out there. It's clearly a five out of five. I can't manage the underlying infrastructure if I want to. There's just no option for it. So what is the app? This is a funny little piece that pro nobody's ever heard of that about uh, seven years ago or so, uh, I was working with a, uh, with a nonprofit, and they needed something to be able to essentially say, we've got 50 books, and people want to split them up and then collate them back together in terms of coverage. So you can do those uh, chapter one, two, and three of book one, and you do chapter four, five, six, and I'll do book two, chapter eight, and we'll bring it all together. I, I wrote it in a week. That's not really fair. It took a few weeks to clean it up. Uh, it was for a nonprofit, and it sort of was a, a stable, it had that nonprofit and a bunch of others used it. I don't even remember if the website is still up for it. Probably is. I haven't looked. Put it in here. I never clicked. Uh, but it, I've used it as a stable for porting things. Why did I do it in Ruby back then? Because Heroku was all there was. I have no great love for Ruby under the language. I'm not a purist. I just don't care. I then rewrote it in Node. Why Node? Other than the fact that I must be a masochist to port one app from one language to another, whatever language that is. No, I have not rewritten Go yet or Rust. It's probably inevitable. Uh, because I needed it in order to get it onto Lambda, which made it a lot easier. Uh, yes, there are shims to get it on, but that wouldn't give me the experience. So first deploy. Heroku, a slug is a complete a single in deployment. That's what they call it. It's kind of wrap it up. They, they'd been a little bit earlier or later. They might have called it a container image, but whatever. There's no server in sight. Uh, it's a classic three-tier app. You, you, your app starts, it has to listen on a port if it wants to receive requests unless it's a worker, but it has to listen. It, it fits with the mindset that most people have had for a long time about what an app is, especially an app that processes requests. It's really easy to reason about. Uh, anybody here currently use Heroku or have used it recently? It's funny. There were, oh, there you go, at least one yes. They were bought for what, about 240 million by Salesforce about five years ago or so? It was, uh, this is the future, it's PaaS. It's funny how they sort of stalled when Salesforce got them. It's really easy to use about, easy to reason about. You're limited in your app environments unless you want to hack around with build packs. Most people don't. Uh, you need to think about scaling, I said, and they did some work on auto scaling. It's really easy to get push something and get it out there. It's really easy to abuse it and screw it up. That face palm is me. Yes, I've done it a few times. Go, what the hell did I do? It's very much open standards. It's easy to think about a 12-factor app. Uh, you use Git to push. It's think, easy to think about processes and proc files. And it, there is nothing locked in about it whatsoever, or nearly nothing. Yeah, they've got this tool belt now, they call it. But deploy to in kube. All right, is it serverless? Well, <laughs> yeah, not as an operator. You cry if you're a kube operator, often. As an app owner, pretty much. It's also easy to reason about, in some ways easier than Heroku, because my app is packaged up in a well-known way, and it listens on one port or two port or a thousand ports, and it has IP addresses, and it can talk to things. And it, I would argue it was built more for the transition than something like Heroku was. It does enable microservices. It encourages them, which anybody coming from a more traditional world, it takes time to learn. Don't limit that. We're all here because we're thinking at least this far, if not that far ahead of most of the community. Think of the cafe table. We are here, not here, those of us in this room. Packaging have a learning curve. Those YAMLs are beastly. I, I use them and I despise them. Uh, but it is as flexible as it gets. 
pretty much, short of running your own bare metal, and even there, it's flexible as it gets to deploy things. Listen on how many ports you want. You don't need to use their handler and their signatures and whatever. The standards are fairly open. And the problem of an operator is, to some degree, if you're willing to use public providers, at least going away. You've got managed Kubernetes services, Azure Container Service, and EKS, and GKE. And even that's going the way of Azure Container Instances and Fargate, which is becoming a serverless-like platform to the point where you don't even think about things like kube at all. You just say, oh, just stick it out there, and it runs it. About that YAML, anybody know who Joe Beta is? I bet anybody with VMware knows who Joe Beta is, because anybody at VMware, they bought their company last week. Nobody seems to know how much it's for, but uh, it clearly must have been a significant amount, given what the uh, investment was in the past. Joe was one of the three people behind Kubernetes, or its previous incarnation, over at Google. He, ran, he did a startup along with another one of them, Craig McLucky, called Heptio, that was bought last week. YAML is, as he said, I'm horrified we're still using it, and yet we use it everywhere. At least the worst of it I've seen yet to date has been the kube one. So deploy three open fast. Is it serverless? Again, it depends. It's got the same operator issues as Kubernetes, but that is going away, or hopefully going away. As an app owner, yes, absolutely. It encourages you to think about functions and purely functions. It is a little bit harder to reason about. It's not just microservices. It enables real functions, small functions you compose together. Nanoservices. I found that no matter how many times I've gone through this, and especially when I went into Lambda and into OpenFAS, I had to think again about where do you break your functions apart? What used to be a microservice is now five functions. And there are five functions here. And it takes time to get your head around it, to actually think about it. The packaging have a learning curve. It's definitely easier than Kube. I should have thrown up here a FAS stack YAML versus a uh, Kubernetes YAML. And you look at the Kubernetes YAML and go, oh my god. And then you look at the FAS stack YAML. And you say, oh, OK, I can live with that. Composability. This is one of the things I like, and you'll see this again in Lambda. There is an open fast function store. It becomes possible to say, I'm going to take this and this and this and this function, and they do most of what I need and just figure out how to weave them together. I don't have to build these things. Uh, it, uh, I mentioned Simon Wardley earlier. He had a map camp about a month and a half ago where uh, he sit, repeated his quote that he's just waiting for the day that two people and a function get acquired for a billion dollars. <laughs> I, I volunteer. Uh, open standard FAS, it uses OCI or open container image packaging. You may not love the image format that came out of Docker, but it's basically tar files with a well-known and well-defined open standard. It has handlers that was supposed to be changed a bit to make it a little bit easier to build. Actually, it required it for the most part at this point. That was supposed to be slightly different. And then Lambda. Well, yes, it's serverless. It's practically defined the serverless market for the most part. Everything I hear is that the people who built Google App Engine going, we did this. Yes, you did. You just did figure out how to market it. Uh, it's hardest to reason about. It enforces nanoservices. What's the time limit now on a Lambda? It used to be 60 seconds. Then it was five minutes. Are they jumped past the five minutes? 15. They're up to 15, finally. If you, you can't have something long running, even 15 minutes. I believe the reason they do it is to encourage you to write nanoservices, write functions, and not to think about uh, things that run for days. It's just not, not built for that. You're, it almost enforces it. The packaging has a learning curve. That's why things like Apex and serverless are around. It's not as simple to think about as you normally would. Your mindset as a systems level, as Charity put it, not as a function, but as systems, has to be different. Composability, they have their application repository. I think it's great. I love it. Proprietary but not opaque standards. So they have their own zip packaging format, but it's not impossible to, to read. It's not that difficult to figure out. It's just not something known and defined. Uh, certainly not on a public open basis. Handlers are the only interface. There's a limited number of runtimes. I, there's a lot of reasons for that, partially because of security, partially because of optimization and startup times. I will wager money, and we know Amazon is a little more closed, that, for example, they're, they've done something with, say, uh, the Golang runtime or Node.js to ensure that the cold startups are much faster than we'll see the, the, you know, the few hundred milliseconds I'd normally see for starting a new process because they're their point of demarcation is a process. There's a full suite of Amazon services. Look, everything serverless is not a function. There's databases. I could write a database using uh, functions in OpenFAS or Lambda. I pray none of you ever uses the database that I write. But I could do it. 
But there are services. There's Aurora Serverless now. There's, of course, DynamoDB. There is, if I want to use messaging buses or, me or notifications, I've got uh, SNS and SQS and Kinesis. And there are services that I need to make it easier so I can just consume things, not worry about deploying and managing them. That creates options to change functions. And that brings me to the next point that I realized as I was trying to wrap my head around decomposing monoliths and microservices for uh, study mesh into individual functions that can deploy. Before I do, this is just uh, uh, an official Amazon, uh, how do you deploy? I forget which app using uh, Lambda. But you notice that there's three, six, seven out of about the 20 things on this quote unquote serverless app are Lambda. All the rest are services you use, SNS and Dynamo and God knows what else. Ah, who, wrote, who said this? Test how old we actually are. <laughs> uh, close, close. It was somebody who worked with Richie, although he's repeated it a few times. So Dennis Richie. The Unix philosophy, write programs that do one thing well. OK, nice. They work together. And this is the big one. Uh, is the light working? Programs handle text streams. It's a universal interface. If I have programs that run on my MacBook or run on a Linux desktop, or for that matter, on a lot of things on Windows now, I don't have to worry about what API they do, because most things will just process input text streams to output text streams. By the way, it's Doug McElroy. Close. KNR was definitely, it definitely gets the point. I wanted to see how many times in Markdown, if the conversion works, uh, uh, the word atomic, which is my company, appears there. It was very easy. I ran a curl, which piped to Pandoc, converted it to Markdown, which piped to grep, which piped to word count. I got, what, four or five pieces of things running around there. And not one of them knows about the other. Not one of them is built for, word count is not built for grep. It knows nothing about grep. It doesn't care. It receives a text stream. It knows what to do with it. Try to do that in Lambda. How does one Lambda call another? Well, either you can make a, you can put the AWS SDK built into your app. Great, now I've really tied it in and it has to know things. I've got, I want to write, uh, uh, where is this? I want to write a grep function. I'm sure there's something in the repository. I want a grep function. I want to get text in and text out, but then has to pass it to something else. I really don't want to start building the AWS SDK into my app which is something I ended up having to do. It ended up being a stumbling block for me when I was porting this. So I really can't easily chain things together. If you ask the Amazon people, they'll tell you, oh, no, not a problem. If you don't want to use the SDK, hand it off to like Kinesis or to a message. Again, it gets messy. It's not that easy to chain things together. OpenFAS, to some degree, has the same question. I can call the API gateway, which is what I actually did. Thanks to Alex, who helped me through with this. But again, it's not that easy. A pure function's not that easy. That having been said, he did tell me about the director uh, pattern which is being done, which is where you have sort of a master function. And I could see doing this in Lambda 2. I wish I'd heard about this from him a few weeks back. Take the uh, a, a master function that calls one function and takes its output and feeds to another. It's not quite pure chaining, but it has sort of like a chain or master that will allow me to say, these four or five functions don't know anything, but they're input and output. And something else knows how to tie them together, a weaver, a director. I think there's a lot of work that can be done to make this sort of part of the core platform, the same way that for years, for 50 years, just about every Unix, and after that BSD, and even now Windows, has some built-in native way of saying, if I want the output of this to go to the output of that, I just put a pipe there. That's, by the way, one of the things that kept me from getting as uh, granular functions that I really wanted to get out of this. Ended up giving up in a number of places. So if you actually look at FAS, what, uh, oh, I'm doing, good, doing well on time. Uh, what are the challenges that I saw that I hit against? And a number of these have been addressed in the conference today and yesterday, or really yesterday, and will be addressed today, which is kind of nice to see. There's froth in it. I'm not the only one to have these problems. The testing. So unit testing is easier. I had a talk with Paul Johnston a few months back where I said, how the hell do you test this stuff? And he said, well, everything now is smaller units. So unit testing is your testing to a large degree. That's true. But I think as we all saw when we broke monoliths down into smaller services, distributed in some way, let alone microservices, and now nano, it's not about testing each one. Integration testing is how do these things play together. I can have 5, 10, 100 functions that work well independently. When I tie them together, they start behaving in weird ways. And just don't, don't give me the business logic output that I was expecting. It's harder. I think Charity's talk addressed some of it. Uh, I 
believe I saw a talk yesterday, I'm blanking on it, about some of the work that people are doing in testing. There's room for improvement in this space, and I'm glad to see people hitting it. But I found testing to be easier on the unit side, harder on the integration side. Monitoring and debugging or observability. I should have changed the slide after Charity's talk. Uh, and no observability is not monitoring, but we can still argue for the next six hours about what the difference is. I'm convinced I'm wrong. I'm just not convinced what the right answer is. These are hyper-distributed systems when you break into FAST. It's just where Monolith had this talking to that, and microservices had maybe 10 services talking to each other. With FAS, I've got 50 or 100 functions. And it, it, it's messy. And yeah, there's Amazon services to help you with it, and you can do your own stacks. And Datadog supposedly has something for it. And there are other vendors coming out there, and now you've got Honeycomb. It's, it, it's not as easy to figure out. And I found myself struggling going, how do I even know what's going on and where things are falling apart? It's much easier with a single stack or a few single stacks running things. Common libraries, frameworks, and functions. What do I do if I have, uh, say, 10 entry points into my app? OK, 12. I was counting how many study mesh I had. 12 entry points into my app. And they all do some common stuff. Do I now include all the, and we all have that, right? None of us wants to build everything from scratch. We all include various libraries or functions in. What do I do if I, I have to, do I include it with all of them? And now my deployment image is much bigger and potentially startup time because of memory load time may be a bit slower. Do I share these out as other functions and now I've got to communicate across? What's the right way to do this? I don't think there is a right way yet. I tried different ways of doing it. All of them had shortcomings. I said, bundled them in, I got bigger images, took me longer. Uh, separated them out, now I've got more services and I've got more areas to think about how things interact. I've got a more complicated system. I'm not convinced there's a, a perfect solution to it yet. This is the big one, life cycle. First of all, the tooling has maturity to go, how do I actually deploy versions of things? How do I deploy, uh, get something deployed out to Lambda in an automated fashion? How do I, we mentioned testing earlier, but how do I build all that stuff in? How do I reason about it? And how does it affect my culture? I'm very big into incentives and culture. And again, my wife laughs at me because when we got married, I was the engineer and she was a psychologist. And now I'm quoting her all the time. I learned a few things. It took a few years. I think it's, your culture changes when your architecture changes. And I'll talk a bit, a bit more about that afterwards if I have the time, which is uh, as of now I do. And last time to market. This is a big one. If I have a team that can do whatever the business requirement is on bare metal server that we happen to have racked at Equinix, uh, pity the poor person who has to cable it, racked at Equinix, and I can do it using some sort of traditional format, and I can do that in two weeks, and the business value is coming in four weeks, versus I can really do this right for the long term in OpenFAS or Lambda or wherever, and it's going to take eight weeks. That, that's tr pretty straightforward. Your market needs you now. I was hoping I'd have enough time for the last three slides on lock-in. So I was thought about giving an entire talk on this. Not happening. Maybe another session. So what is lock-in? This is the Golang template for uh, one of the Golang templates off the Amazon site for uh, Lambda. Is this lock-in? Well, I've built it around a certain handler structure, and now all my apps need it. It's not that hard to write something that will wrap these and run it if I ever need to get off Lambda. But it is to some degree, because now it's not just a few ops people need to manage it. I've got tens, hundreds, thousands of engineers who've wrote th who've written things, who have written things, that have used that. And now I've got code everywhere. What was it she said earlier? As soon as you write code, it becomes technical debt. But what about this? Heroku config, environment variables, and all these dependencies. I mean, is that lock-in? To some degree, now I'm dependent on what's there. What about this? This is a Kubernetes YAML. It's a really simple one to run two copies of Nginx. Probably the simplest one I've seen. It's right off the Kube website. They're never that simple. Uh, is that lock-in? Well, my app itself doesn't know anything about this, but now I have all these YAMLs floating all over the place that now tie my app to some degree to there, and I have to change them to deploy it somewhere else. But what is that lock-in? Is assuming I'm going to have a text stream, is that a form of lock-in? So my perspective on this is the following. Every platform has some binding. I need something to tell the platform how to run my app. There's nothing that's ever going to be 100% pure. Oh, look, it's just an, I, there's going to be something there. 
bigger or smaller app config packaging something, there's some cost of onboard and offboard. Anyone know what that is? I don't think anybody will recognize it. Opening scene of War Games. Who here has seen War Games? All right, remember that opening scene where uh, it's, he became a famous actor after that, where he says, turn your switch, sir. It's, they, they, they believe that he's not, they did a test. And he pulls out his gun, turn your, this is him holding the switch. I can't remember the name of the actor. Became a very famous actor, the, the senior officer on the left. Lock-in is not this. It's not I turn the switch, I launch 10, uh, 10 ICBMs, and I've now blown up the world, and I can never bring them back. It, that's not true. That is not lock-in. It's not a binary thing. Lock-in, when I talk about lock-in, what I'm really saying is, am I willing to spend 1,000 pounds, 100,000 pounds, a million dollars now to avoid paying 1,000 pounds, a million pounds, $5 million in five years when I think I'm going to get off this platform? Spending money now to save money later has a term. We've done this for about five, 600 years. It's called insurance. Avoiding lock-in is buying an insurance policy. It's spending money now to avoid problems later. We know how to calculate, and CFOs are really good at this, what I buy insurance for. I guarantee you this site has a policy that covers them if somebody, may it not happen, trips and breaks an arm. They probably don't have a policy if somebody decides to, may it never happen, launch a nuclear warhead around here and people get ill of radiation. I was at your place. I'm suing you for 100 million pounds. They, make, they take a look at risks and they figure them out. It's called net present value. We figure out what it's going to cost me then, probabilities, you adjust it for risk. Lock-in is about this. I don't really believe in lock-in. I believe lock-in should be a discussion to be had about risk. That is somewhat controversial because I think that Amazon will tell you, don't ever think about lock-in. It's not a problem. We're all here for you forever. And others will say, no, no, you can't ever use it. There's a middle ground here. Figure out what it costs. And I do promise you, at some point, if your organization or business survives, you will move off of whatever platform it is. No platform will be here forever. Ask IBM how their mainframes are doing. So technology takeaways. Oh, perfect timing. Constraints are liberating. Harry Houdini, by the way. Uh, interesting point. I visited the Harry Houdini house in Budapest uh, last year. It's really funny because Harry Houdini and his family fled Hungary to the United States because Hungary wasn't a very receptive environment for him. But once he died and became famous, they decided they really liked him and they've sort of readopted him as a, as a son. But it is a great museum. It's a lot of fun. They do magic tricks. Constraints are liberating. Being required to run with only certain structures and only certain ways you can do things actually is pretty good. Being told, I can't, I, here's my app. I open a port. I can't open this port. I have to use it at handlers was hard at first. But then it becomes very liberating afterwards when suddenly I don't have to think about things. I, I discovered that the first time I went into something that was actually with a handler, the first time I went into both OpenFAS and Lambda, but uh, it started with Lambda. The first time I went in there, I went, I, I, I want to open a port. That's how I listen. This thing listens. I don't need to. Well, where's my route handlers? Oh, to hand it off to something else. Hand it off to the API gateway or hand it off to the Amazon API gateway. I don't have to think about it. And then you come back to it the next time you do something. Like, what do you mean I have to write this stuff again? No, I don't write those things anymore. It's just a config file I hand off. Constraints are, are actually liberating. They're really good, assuming they're not too constrained. Match your local to your cloud. Uh, something we've been doing for a long time, and this, I think his legacy as far back as the 60s or 70s, is saying, well, we have these production environments. And they have big things, like big Oracle or Sybase databases. Are they still around? I have no idea if Sybase still exists. Use them heavily. No idea if they're here. We have the big, sci uh, big Oracle databases or big production whatever databases, and we can't run them locally or in our dev environment, so we'll have something that kind of looks or smells like it or feels like it. And there's a little shim there. It's not too different. As you move into serverless things, you start to think about things like serverless databases because you want to deal with charging, like serverless Aurora or like running things in some form of, your, uh, some form of uh, spun up a container of something. And you start to say, oh, OK, but I can just shim it out and make it look like this over here so I can just run my things. Don't. I tried to do that. And I ended up creating so much complicated stuff to map between here and there. You want your stuff locally to look as much as it looks like in the cloud. And the cloud can be anywhere you run it. In case I'm just curious, one of these is Dynamo. One of these is RRI. I just don't remember which. Service to data sync. If you start to use services, and this was particularly a problem that I hit when I, hit, when I went into Lambda, you start to use services. You say, oh, I don't need to authenticate users. I've got Cognito. I think I put, yeah, I did put Cognito there. OK, great. But 
this is an app that actually associates lots of things with users, not just their profile, associates what books they've picked and, and what chapters and have they completed it and everything. Where do I store that? Oh, well, uh, uh, traditionally we'd store it in the same database we use for authentication or data store. Now I've got some sort of data service and I've got this and I start having these sync problems. I have to think about it. I can't store arbitrary data over in some authentication service. It's just not a good way to do it. How do I register users? How do they suddenly, I used to register users, you'd sign up, you'd confirm your email or your mobile or whatever it is, and then you'd be in the right place. Now they're created here, but I have to worry about them being created here. You have multiple data stores. It gets kind of messy. This was the one that kind of threw me for a loop. Uh, for a web app, what's your web front end? This is the uh, official how you write a web app using Lambda. I think it can apply to most other things. But notice what they say here. All your static stuff is in S3, Cognito for user authentication, and all your API calls over HTTP, and somewhere down there they say you should use uh, um, Ajax or WebSockets or whatever. There's an assumption you're writing a single page app here. A lot of the serverless stuff, but not all of it, works a lot better, or there's at least an assumption that it'll work better if you're writing a single page app. I love single page apps. It's great that it's been developed over the years. There are times when it doesn't make sense. There's a bit of a movement now back towards at least some server side rendering, at least for initial loads. I, I, this, this ended up trying to do the stuff in here, ended up being very inefficient and creating all sorts of problems for me. I did it anyways because I wanted to see what would happen. And last is change. It's not really a technology takeaway, but it's easy because look how many things you don't have to worry about anymore. Somebody else is worrying about it. Somebody else may be, I am an app developer. My IT department's managing the Coop cluster or the Coop cluster that OpenFAS is running on, or just Amazon because it's all in Lambda, or whatever it is, or Heroku because they're managing the servers. But it's also hard because I'm changing how I operate. In summary, the less they worry about, the better. Anybody here done IPMI tool in the last year? No. Who wants to? Anybody here thought about what the cooling on the stack of the servers? I said, unless you have to, don't. Sometimes you have to. So the less you worry about, the better. But architecture does matter. If I change my architecture, I will change the skills and culture and designs. And it's not the two people in this room who work for company X. It's the 35 other people who are in your company. You have to think about everything that changes. That's hard. It's sort of the reverse. Conway law, right? Your architecture reflects your organization. If you pick new architecture, you have to change your organization to match it to a large degree. That's something people don't think about it on the tech side. Change takes a lot of time. We are humans. I had somebody who, I, I ran a short run CIO role I had for a very short period of time when the organization, it, it was built, a culture built not to change and somebody said to me, look, it takes two days for concrete to set in optimal weather and humidity conditions. If it's the right mix and everything, you cannot do it faster. If you say, but I really want it to set in a day and then build the rest of your building on top of it, please tell me because I'm not going into that building. It's going down. It takes time for people to change, for things to change. It also takes time to get your life cycle benefits. I don't care how fast you can deploy a service in OpenFast or Lambda or whatever. It's about the system. It's about all the things around it. And it takes a, a while for all the tooling and pieces and organization and processes to be as good as or better than what you had before. I have absolutely no, this is one of my favorite questions. I do uh, alumni interviews for my alma mater. Uh, I have no idea if a Prius is better for the environment. I am ignorant about these things. I do know that I don't care about how much uh, petroleum you call here, petroleum it uses versus the other one. I care about the entire life cycle of it. What about manufacturing costs? What about disposal of the batteries? It could be better, I have no idea. I'm open enough to say I'm ignorant. Focus on the benefits you need. It is not about purity. We're all doing this, unless you're doing it for your own fun. Lift and shift is okay. If I can take an app and copy it over, perfect, last slide. If I can take an app and copy it over and deploy it and people get some deployment or benefits or I don't have to manage servers anymore, that's great. Worry about detaching it and breaking it into multiple services later. Worry about scaling after. Get the benefits you need of it. Think about the cafe table. Remember, serverless is not FAS or nano services. Serverless includes it. Serverless encompasses it, assuming I got my math symbols correctly, and I think I did. Remember, if we lose the business this, this week, next week there is no next month, build what you need. Just make the organization happy, live to fight another day. I don't remember which general was said it, but it's okay to retreat if you live to fight another day. Thank you.